And I'm happy now to introduce Father Michael Jonkus, who'll be with us for the afternoon. Uh, he's known to many of us through his music that we sing at Mass. I didn't realize that he's the composer of over 300 liturgical pieces and counting. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've only sung 250 of them in my church, so. <laughs> he is a priest of this archdiocese and holds degrees in liturgy from Notre Dame University and from the Pontifical Institute of Liturgy at Santa Anselmo in Rome. Father Michael has served in parish ministry and campus ministry and has been a professor in Catholic studies at the University of St. Thomas. Currently, he is an artist in residence, which he tells me he means he gets to compose full-time now. It's a dream, yeah. <laughs> Father Michael is going to take this afternoon to consider really the question of the theme of this day, of being holy as God is holy. And what are its implications? What could they be for us as ministers who serve and lead in our parishes? So please help me welcome me, Father Michael Jonkus. <laughs> Thank you. I always believe in letting people know what I'm going to do, so if they want to leave, they can. <laughs> I have basically three things that I want to do with you today. First, first half hour is to look at, from an anthropological point of view, what holiness might be and then go to the scriptures and look at the holiness of God. Then we take a little break. Second half hour, I want to look at the holiness of Christ and the holiness of the Holy Spirit. Take a little break. And at the end, the holiness of the church. So, as that famous theologian Betty Davis once said, <laughs> fasten your seatbelts, this is gonna be a bumpy ride. <laughs> Now I want to start by grounding the entire presentation in the prayer, the formal liturgy of the church. And one of the segments of our Eucharistic prayers, revised after the Second Vatican Council, is called the Vere Sanctus. You probably remember at the end of the preface we all sing Sanctus, 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 Holy, Holy, Holy. And then the priest begins the Eucharistic prayer by saying, Vere Sanctus, truly you are holy. Now, I want you to hear the various Eucharistic prayers, what they say. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and the working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice might be offered to your name. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and from the world's beginning are ceaselessly at work so that the human race may become holy just as you yourself are holy. You see, not just the church, but the entire universe of human beings. And final example, you are indeed holy and to be glorified, O God, who love the human race and who always walk with us on the journey of life. Blessed indeed is your Son, present in our midst when we are gathered by his love and when, as once for the disciples, so now for us, he opens the scriptures and breaks the bread. I think those are stunning texts and they're worthy of a fair amount of contemplation. But for what I'm going to do, that's just background now, what I'm going to do is try to get at the idea of the holy. And to do that, I'm going to use three languages. Language number one is going to be Hebrew. And the word I want you to remember is Kodesh. Excellent. Now, Kodesh actually means to cut, to sever, to divide, to separate. And the idea is that holiness is a quality that separates whatever it is, a time, a season, a person, 
that separates that from the profane, right? Tohar, uh, uh, the question of purity or cleanness also comes into this idea of kodesh. In the New Testament, we shift to Greek, and the word here is hagios, hagios, right? And here it means belonging now to cultic worship or to the gods, plural, because it's a culture that believed in multiple gods. I hope you can also see that it gets adopted by the early Christians in their writing to talk about those of us who are baptized. We are the hagioi, we are the holy ones, we are the saints, right? And, and, and likewise, there's a contrasting term, hagnos, which means clear or pure, like the purity, cleanness that we see in the Hebrew form. But the biggest one is a Latin phrase that Rudolf Otto, um, codified in 1917. He explored the idea of the holy and used a completely new term, the numinous, the numinous. And when they asked him to define it, he jumped to Latin. <laughs> the mysterium tremendum et fascinans. It is the overwhelming, magnificent, tremendous mystery which is terrifying, but at the same time is attractive and alluring and fascinating. To hold those two things together, this overwhelming otherness and a kind of allure is what the holy is about. So for Rudolf Otto, negatively, it's the sacred minus its moral and rational aspects. So most of us, when we think of holiness, automatically think of people who do good deeds. They're morally upright. It's not how the Bible thinks about it. So it's the sacred minus its moral and rational aspects. And positively, the holy does three things. It inspires awe, which in most of us means that we're profoundly uneasy. To enter into the realm of the sacred is to have a sense that I don't belong here. This is not my world of space and time. Something else is happening here. A sense, secondly, of overpoweringness, which tends to generate a feeling of humility before the creator of all the stars of the heavens. Who am I, right? And finally, a sense of energy, that this power is something that has immense vigor that it's stronger than, than we are. And thus the idea of worshiping the holy is, at least for Rudolf Otto, something that's true for all human beings. Now, I'm gonna shift now to Israel's culture map. So rather than looking at the holy considered generally, I'm gonna look specifically now at how our Jewish brothers and sisters thought about holiness. Now, to get into this, I have to warn you, this is anthropological theory. And the idea is that you can analyze different cultures by putting them on certain kinds of grids. In this case, I'm gonna give you two axes and you'll, you'll see how it operates. Um, but just to make it clear that all, <laughs> frankly, all human societies have these kind of culture maps. They're frequently the things we are trained to do that we never think about. It's just what the culture tells us is the right thing to do. And my easiest example, well, I'll give you two examples. Um, imagine now that you have a glass of pure, clean water, and you take a sip of the water, and you swirl it around in your mouth, and then you spit it back into the glass, and then drink it down, right? What's your visceral reaction? <laughs> Except think, there's nothing in the glass that wasn't in you first, right? <laughs> it's a cultural map, right? I'll give you another one. And this, this I give to my mother. I really give her credit for this. Um, there are proper and improper ways of dealing with our viscous fluids, right? <laughs> So, for example, we think when thinking about the Indian culture of people who would get rid of mucus by putting one hand there and going, ah, and then another hand there and going, ah, and getting rid of their mucus. 
And we'd think that's barbaric because of course what you're supposed to do is get a lovely piece of linen and preferably with your initials marked on the linen, right? And then you go, honk, and you fold it over as though it were a precious relic and you carry it with you, right? Do you see what I'm doing? That's a culture map axis, how we deal with our viscous fluids. And in this case, we're going to look at the issue of holiness and cleanness. So on Israel's culture map, the holy is opposed to the profane. I've already set that up for you. The Hebrew roots you can look at, but the sacred versus the common. Another way of talking about it is to say that the holy or the sacred is a marked state versus the profane, which was the normal state. And I'll just give you a linguistic version of that. Um, we have some things that are marked and some things that are just normal state that you can see in our language. So for example, normal state language says man. A marked state is the woo man man with a womb. You see it? So there's this kind of prejudice in the language that normativity is male and females are marked as separate from that. You get the idea, right? So the marked state here is holiness. Most of the time, holiness is not exploding in the midst of Israel. It is of graded degrees. And the easiest way to, to, to point that out is to look at the Israelite temple where one section of the temple the holy of holies nobody entered except the high priest once a year after having undergone all sorts of preparation rituals to keep from getting killed by the presence of the holy then you have of course the court of the priests and the court of the men and the court of the women and the court of the Gentiles you see it all gradated versions of holiness. We actually used to have that within Roman Catholicism. If you can remember how there were a certain number of steps that went up to the altar platform, and then beyond that, the tabernacle absolutely in the center, and who was allowed to touch the tabernacle? Only priests, as they uh, manipulated the, 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 the hosts, um, well, anyway, I'm not going to go on on it. But you can see gradated, right, holiness. Where the profane state, it's non-gradated. Holiness is powerful and, frankly, deadly. Because we profane people in our common world are not proper to that world. And I'll give you an example of that in a second. Holiness is restricted and contagious where the profane is neutral. So what you did in Israel's culture is sanctify or made holy objects and persons and all the rest of it by means of ritual. But you could also profane something by intention or absolutely inadvertently by taking away its holiness and returning it to the world of the profane. Now I'll give, I'll, I'll give you two examples and I hope that'll be good. Do you remember the story of uh, David bringing the Ark of the Covenant to Bethlehem? And the Ark is on the back of a donkey. And so it's tilting back and forth, back and forth. And one poor schlub reaches out, right, to, to make sure that the Ark of the Covenant is upright, that it doesn't fall into the dust. So he touches the Ark and is immediately killed. And we read that passage and think, this is just bizarre. Why would the God of the heavens kill someone simply because he wanted to make sure that the Ark of the Covenant didn't fall into the dust? Well, what we don't get is that for this world, holiness can appear like nuclear power appears for us. Utterly invisible, completely powerful, and frankly, nuclear power doesn't care whether or not I have the right intention when I walk into the reactor. 
I have to have protective clothing or I'm going to die, right? Same issue here. The power of God, power of Yahweh, is so intense that it, it needs to be protected against. On the other hand, one can profane things totally inadvertently. So if a rabbi was supposed to keep himself ritually clean, and that's the next thing we're going to look at, um, if he was walking out among the people and the shadow of a menstruating woman fell on him, he was made ritually unclean. It wasn't his intention. Do you see the, the thing that's going on? The way Israel maps its world. So part of it is that, that holy and profane categorize space, time, persons, objects, and offerings. But it also has another access, which is the clean and the unclean. The clean is stuff that belongs. It's in place. The unclean is the stuff that's out of bounds. Now, don't think about this as dirt. It has nothing to do with dirt. It's a different way of marking the culture map for Israel. So different core words. The normal state is to be clean. To be unclean, out of bounds, is the marked state. Cleanliness is non-graded, but there's all sorts of graded degrees of uncleanliness. Ordinary is to be clean, but to be unclean is to be caught up in certain powers that you don't expect. Clean, neutral, unclean, contagious. And what do you do? You cleanse, no, you make something clean, again by ritual, usually water. Um, and secondly, you can pollute or make something unclean by activity or inadvertently. So I did that really fast, but you can see it's the same kind of cultural map that you've got, but just with, with new terms. So this categorizes space, persons, objects, and food. Now, here's the most important thing I want you to get from this. What are the consequences of Israel thinking about holiness in this way? To be profane or clean was normal. It was the typical state of daily life. To be holy or unclean was extraordinary and contagious. It puts you in a different status vis-a-vis -vis the culture. Holy and clean, that's okay, not a problem. Profane and clean, that's okay, not a problem. Profane and unclean, that's okay, not a problem. But holy and unclean, that's a nuclear reaction, right? So. Uh, in all circumstances, Israel sets up its culture to separate the unclean from the holy. Really important. Okay. G good enough? Okay. Now I'm just checking time here. Okay. Now, what I want to deal with, secondly, is God's holiness. And I'm going to use three um, Old Testament examples for you. God's holiness is his defining characteristic. It's not an aspect of who he is or what he does. It is the essence of who he is. Remember Isaiah? The Holy One of Israel. The title. The holiness of God is a term used in the Bible to describe both God's goodness and God's power. Holiness is completely unique and utterly all-powerful, radiating out from God like an energy. I already used nuclear re reactor as an example. Think of the radiance of the sun. And once again, you have to protect yourself from getting sunburned based on uh, how the sun is going to interact with you. You get the idea. And finally, God's holiness is so overwhelming that it can actually be dangerous to approach without the proper safeguards. So, here are the stories. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within the bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. Did you get it? In the profane world, bushes catch on fire and burn up. 
turn into ash. This is an inbreaking of the holy world where a bush is on fire and it doesn't get eaten up, doesn't get burned up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from the bush, Moisha, Moisha. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer. Take off your sandals for the place where you is, are standing is holy. And then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Get it? That's Israel's culture map of how holiness operates. And their most important prophet is clearly caught up with how do I deal with this utterly transcendent God? Example number two. God's holiness in the call vision of Isaiah. Says Isaiah, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Did you catch that? It must be unbelievably massive if just the train of his robe was enough to fill the entire temple. Above him were seraphim, Seraph, You remember seraph serpents, the fiery serpents when their bite hit? Think of these not as little babies with wings flying. <laughs> what these are is fire, pure fire, right? Above the seraphim, each with six wings. With two weeks, wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they were flying. Even the heavenly beings are terrified of the presence of God, of God's holiness. And they were calling to one another, Kadosh, 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 Yahweh Sabaoth. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, a little footnote. Did you catch that the seraphim are singing to each other? Did you also catch that they wouldn't be able to address God directly? You ready? What do we sing at the end of the Eucharistic prayer? Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. What the angels can't sing in this vision, we are given the right to sing as members of the baptized. We're breaking through the terror of the holy. Um, yes, I have enough time for one uh, quick story, and that's a midrash. Uh, our Jewish brothers and sisters love to tell stories based on the scriptures, and they're not really what the scriptures are, but they're free interpretations. So, here's the question. Say the rabbis. So, why holy, holy, holy? Why three times holy? Why do we do that? Ah, said a rabbi. Very easy. As the seraphim cried out, holy, holy, holy. Right? It's the echo. That's right? So when you go to the cathedral and get to celebrate there, the Lord be with you, 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 you. Right? 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 So holy, holy, holy. Uh, uh, Alternative, and this one's actually my favorite. The alternative midrash is it's two seraphim, and they're singing one to another, and the first sings, Holy, and the second sings, I'll see you're holy and raise you one. Holy, holy. <laughs> right? right? So you begin to get it, that's midrash, so okay. But notice the reaction of Isaiah Woe to me. I cried. Not, oh, how wonderful it is that I can see you, and how glorious it is that I can see your heavenly creatures. Woe to me. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. Hear it, clean, unclean? I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, Yahweh Almighty. I don't belong here. So what happens? Then one of the seraphs comes 
with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar, and with it he touched the prophet's mouth and say, said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. Did you catch it? That now we've had the kind of behaviors needed to cleanse, the kind of behaviors needed to make the person able to bear the holiness of God. And I love the next part. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. You have now prepared me to be a messenger of your holiness. Third and finally, God's holiness in the heavenly worship of Revelation. Um, I'm caught for time, so I'm just going to have you notice that it's a picture of heaven with 24 elders dressed in white and flashes coming from the throne and on and on and on. But notice the four living creatures and each of the four living creatures having six wings covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. And day and night, they never stopped singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Now, why is this so important? Because this is a Christian scripture that the Christian community, the early Christian community, does not reject its heritage It takes its Jewish heritage very seriously and, in fact, incorporates it, at least in this one stream of tradition. So holy, holy, holy is God. Now, questions for reflection. When have I experienced, or when do I experience, God's holiness? Overwhelming, awesome, a sense that I don't belong here, a sense that I'm not worthy of this, and yet at the same time, attraction when and how does my parish community experience God's holiness is Sunday worship an awesome experience when and how do we invite people to experience God's holiness with um, students that have no religious background they consider themselves nuns that's what they tell me right not n-u-n-s but n-o-n-e-e-s when i try to get at this what what might the experience of holiness be like imagine that you're at the top of the empire state building and you're looking out over the edge of it and there is going on in you at the same time utter terror that I could fall and hit the ground and, and at the same time this peculiar attraction, I could fling myself out into this, right? That's part of, it's a tiny little version of it, but that's part of the overwhelmingness of this experience of the awe of God. So, a little image for you. Uh, I love this. Moses, there's the burning bush, afraid to look at it. Okay, <clears throat> now, the next part of this is Christ's holiness. And I'm going to do this likewise with just three images. But I'm going to back it up first by saying the issue is really for Christians. How does Jesus, this 100% man, how does he manifest, represent, embody, incarnate the God that we knew from our Jewish heritage. How can he be 100% human and 100% divine? The church spent centuries struggling with that. So watch what happens in these stories. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, the disciples, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the board, so that the boat was already being swamped. But Jesus was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Notice the title they give him. It's not yet kurios, it's not yet Lord, it's teacher, one like us. He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. 
and the wind ceased, and there was dead calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe. Think Isaiah and the vision of God. They were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who is this? Who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? He's not just a human being, although he's totally human being. Who is he? What is he? Right? And that sense of awe, and uh, again, you'll, you'll see the same kind of things in some of the stories about Peter, a sense that I don't belong in your presence. Leave me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. Right? Next part. Oh, dear. Uh, you must talk among yourselves because this just closed down on me. Okay. Uh, let's see if I can get it to work. There we go. So, Christ's holiness now in the miraculous catch of fish. Is that what's up? Okay. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, right? Not Lord, but Master. We've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I'll let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, for I am a sinful man. Right? Isaiah. I am a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. And I've seen the living God. Right? So Simon is absolutely thunderstruck by who this Jesus might be. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish with they are taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. And then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. Did you catch it? Just like Isaiah was given a mission after his cleansing, so here Peter and other disciples are given a mission. Okay, finally, let's see. oh, I do have time. So finally, third image is Christ's holiness manifest in the story of the transfiguration. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. And there he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Well, if that's not an inbreaking of a completely different world, I don't know what is. This is not profane, regular reality. Something else is taking place. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, not yet Lord. It is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. I think that's a stunning insight. And frankly, one of the problems I have as a liturgist, when I experience the holy, I want to make sure that it fits into the liturgical forms, right? So here's Feast of Tabernacles. Let's make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This one, this one is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Do you see the ultimate revelation now? That this is not just a human being, although he is a totally a human being. This is the manifestation of the living God in the midst of our history. And suddenly when they looked around, they were back in the profane world. They no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. So a final little note on this before I give you some more reflection questions. It may help to remember the difference between John the Baptist and Jesus, both of whom have a mission from God. 
and both of whom, at least at one point in their ministry, become apocalyptic prophets. But look, John the baptizer goes off to the Jordan River, and he expects those who want to be um, uh, cleansed to come out to him, right? And then he does his preaching. God, the living God, the God of the cherubim, that God is utterly horrified at what you human beings have done with history. God is bringing an end to history. And maybe, just maybe, if you plunge into the waters, the waters will protect you from the holiness of God. That when God appears in all of God's majesty and everything is burned up, you might be saved, right? Here comes the fun part. That's John the baptizer's preaching, but that's not Jesus' preaching. Jesus preaches ah, by going to people's homes, by going to their, their villages, by going into the agora. Jesus preaches, and what's his preaching? The God of the cherubim is enraged at what sin has done to history. And he's bringing his judgment. And his judgment is mercy. Mercy for everyone. The judgment has come. And we stand under the judgment. We stand under the mercy of God. So can you see the shift now? from the overwhelming, terrifying holiness of God that we see in some of the Jewish scripture and now Jesus embodying the mercy of God. Good enough? Okay. Then, here are your questions. When have I experienced the holiness of Christ? In prayer? In sacramental worship? In reading and pondering scripture? Seeking and receiving forgiveness? alleviating suffering, maybe working for justice? When have I experienced the holiness of Christ? This one I actually prepared before I heard your excellent talk, so I think you're going to see something that we're really converging. How does our parish community witness to the God who is simultaneously wholly other and utterly intimate in Jesus? Third and finally, how do we then accompany people as they experience Christ's holiness at different stages in their life? The way a preschooler experiences this holiness is going to be very different than a way someone 70 years old and possibly facing death will experience it. How do we accompany folks? Okay, and an image of the transfiguration? Good, that's up. Now, the holiness of the Holy Spirit. And this one, frankly, I could only do by pointing to some words in the different languages. So if you want to look this up, what's really helpful is Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, where notice ruach, the, the term that we were talking about, wind, spirit, breath, right? The ruach Yahweh, the breath of God, the spirit of God, is revealed as the spirit of Hachma and Bina, wisdom and understanding, Esa Geburah, of counsel and might, Da'at and Yirat, the spirit of knowledge and of fear of Yahweh, the holy fear, the appropriate fear, right? So you get that coming from Jewish scripture, and the Christian scriptures likewise don't so much give us examples of the Holy Spirit operating so much as giving titles. The pneumatos hagiu, remember hagios, holy? The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. The parakletos, the comforter. The advocate, parakletos, alongside speaker. I love this. <laughs> the, the defense attorney that speaks on your behalf. In the, in the trials, right? The paraclete. The pneumotis aletheas, the spirit of truth, and ultimately it is the spirit of Christ. Welcome to orthodoxy. 
that by pondering these scriptures, we come to know that the Spirit of God the Father and the Spirit of Christ is the Holy Spirit. So this triune God is finally not uh, articulated theologically, but certainly uh, given to us, prepared for us by the scriptures. What are your questions for reflection? <clears throat> so, how do I discern the presence and the guidance of the Holy Spirit in my life? Exactly your question. How do I discern this? How do I learn to discern this? How do we discern the presence and guidance of the Holy Spirit in our parish community or, our, or even our local church? I've heard tell that there might be a, a synod associated with our local church. How would we help the Holy Spirit, how, more accurately, how the Holy Spirit help us to discern what God is calling us to do in this world? Third, okay, and then, yeah, I love that, <laughs> because, again, no exact images, but these swirls of color, which may give you a sense of the, the freedom of the Spirit. I think I have enough time. I do, okay. Now, what are the life impacts of God's holiness if our exploration is in any way adequate? First, holiness provides comfort. The fact that God is holy is something you can cling to in the really breakdown moments of life. Evil is not in control. Injustice does not rule Corruption is not king, and Satan will not have victory. That's a profound truth. God is and always will be worthy of trust because God is holiness. I love that. I'm uh, a, a depressive, like most uh, artists. I hit these <laughs> bottom things, and it seems like the whole world is falling apart. To be able to cling to the fact of the holiness of God is a magnificent gift. Holiness induces rebuke. It is only in the face of the holiness of God that we fully realize, here it comes, that sin is more than a list of bad behaviors. I missed my morning and evening prayers 126 times, <laughs> right? Now, by the way, missing morning and evening prayers can be sinful. It's possible. But listing them as a bunch of bad behaviors doesn't get at the heart of what sin is. It's more than breaking a set of abstract rules. What is sin? It is a disastrous condition of the heart that causes us to willingly and repeatedly rebel against the authority of God and do what we were never intended to do. The madness of rejecting overpowering love, and yet there it is. So experiencing holiness invites rebuke. We begin to discover that we are not as holy as we think we are. And that is not necessarily tragedy. It becomes instead an impetus to trusting the God, to receiving from the God what God wishes to give to us, grace. Thirdly, holiness defines calling. To say that we are holy means that we have been set apart by God's grace for God's purpose. Our allegiance is no longer to the kingdom of our successes and our happiness but to the progress of God's reign of glory and grace. I can't say anything more about that. That's just, right, that's our calling, okay. So finally, the holiness of the church. Ephesians 5, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, did you catch it? Baptism, but baptism now in the context of the Jewish heritage of water as a way of protecting oneself against the outbreak of God's holiness. And to present the church to himself as a radiant church, 
without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, blemish but holy and blameless. First Peter, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And this is my favorite. You, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, ethnos hogion, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the marvels of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. There's our mission. Now, questions for reflection. These ones may be the ones that are most important if you want to do any of this stuff as a staff and talk them through about your parish community. First, in what ways is the church supposed to be distinct from the world in which we live? And in what ways is it to leaven the world in which we live? Second, in what ways is the church's worship to be distinct from the world? And in what ways is it to baptize the worship of the world? Hint, 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 I'll give you an easy example. The easiest place to look at this question is around matrimony and the number of struggles parish staffs have about matrimony because the va values that are being proclaimed are so different. Now, here's a tough one. It is quite possible to interpret the procession of the bride with her father down the center aisle of the church at a wedding. It's possible to interpret that as the triumph of sexism because she, as chattel property, is on the arm of one man who transfers her into the ownership of another man just before the altar. You could argue that, but anyone who's experienced it knows that this is in many cases a daughter's chance to have an intimate interaction with her father. And that interaction of love is not something to be scorned. It might be something to be blessed. You hear it? That the church baptizes that. It makes it part of the church's own worship. Yeah, good enough. Um, oh, gee, it closed on me again. Uh, I have to... There we go. So, in what ways is the church's worship to be st distinct from the world, and in what ways is it to baptize the world? In what ways is the church's message to be distinct from the world's message? Our secular narrative, by and large, is progress. Every day, in every way, we're getting better and better. The church's understanding of sin and judgment cuts through that narrative. No. While the hope of redemption and free grace through Christ's work offers hope if we begin to despair at the power of evil at work in our world. You see it? What's the narrative that we bring to this? How do we interact with the narrative of the world? So in what ways is it to be distinct from the world's message, and in what ways is it to identify and confirm the gospel values at work in the world? Fourth and finally, in what ways is the church to display a distinct unity versus the cultural, political, racial, socioeconomic, and class fragmentation of the world? Are we the vision of what humanity might be according to God's will? Maybe. And you see now a lovely John August Swanson seriograph, uh, the Festival of Lights, which I tend to see as a meditation on the reality of the church. And I thought in the next eight minutes, um, if there are wonders, questions, problems, hopes, desires, or fears, I'd be happy to try to entertain them if you want to raise them. And then we have a final ritual act together. So, 
Comments, questions, wonders, problems, hopes, desires, fears. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I assume these, the, the, the yeah. versions of them, yeah. I know, it's after lunch. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. Then I think what we need to do... Oh, go ahead. Michael, if you'd be willing to share maybe uh, your own experience of, of uh, experiences you offered with your God. Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the... the Thanks for the, for the question. W would I be willing to share an experience of the awesomeness of God in my life? Yes, and there are actually many of them as I now look back over my history. But probably the most intense was uh, coming down with Guillaume Barre and being paralyzed. And everything, <laughs> everything I knew about myself, what was regular life, profane existence, was taken away. I couldn't talk, I couldn't feed myself, I couldn't, none of that. And when I tried to pray, all the forms of prayer that were available to me as a priest, the divine office, mass, I couldn't do any of those because I couldn't see, right? So a different experience of God arose through that. Partially it was because I was absolutely surrounded by love. My, my family and my friends coming to visit me. Uh, I won't go on on that. I get a little emotional. Um, but what happened then to my experience of God was it became much more visceral. God, I know now, is a God of rescue. There's no reason why I should have been. And yet, I believe he did rescue me for some purpose and I'm, I'm, prof <laughs> I'm profoundly aware of two things. Number one, my own sinfulness in the light of his call. And two, his absolute faithfulness uh, and the gratitude I have for that. So, uh, does that, is that okay? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? That's a profound question. Um, and I, I will just say this. I am really happy to be part of the Catholic Christian tradition because we spend all of our time not only looking back over 20 centuries to get some kind of insights into what happened then, maybe telling us something about what we need to do now, but we're also looking ahead and meanwhile, we're engaging with each other from different cultures and different assumptions and different expectations. I, th I think that's absolutely stunning. That's why I love being a Catholic Christian. Now, please don't take this too seriously, right? I think there are times when some ministers believe that it's their responsibility to protect Jesus from the church to protect Jesus from the church's own members. And that doesn't make any sense to me at all. No, I mean, we, we are the people of radical welcome, radical welcome, as Jesus was. Now, figuring out how that's going to work in our world of space and time, that's the ongoing discussion. Does that help at all?
How, how do I get people over the hump of, I didn't hear the... Oh. Yeah. Okay, I, I, the honest answer is I don't know, right? <laughs> because each individual story is so different. But these are the principles I'd use. Number one, it's not me, it's the Spirit. The Spirit is the one who will evoke in people this hunger for union with God that we call holiness, this kind of transformation. Uh, the, the Eastern uh, fathers call it de theosis, to become divinized, right? Now, where does that... So first point is it's the Spirit that's going to actually do that longing in people. But the second is to try to find appropriate moments in people's lives when they might be open to a deeper meaning to their human experience. And frankly, <laughs> even though I'm not very good at it, I love working with pre-marriage couples because there is this breakthrough in them. Now, again, naive sometimes, you know, the, the line that we had here from Michael Naughton, you know, our love will see us through, huh, right? <laughs> but, what they've, but what they have is this incredible sense that they are no longer to live for themselves. They're to live for another. And it is, I think, pretty easy to make the connection in their life experience to then try to figure out can you see that Jesus himself lived for you and lives for you? He might also be appealing to you to live for him and his message. So in the end, I think it's, it's finding those transformative moments in people's lives and then trying to capitalize on it. So best I can come up with, sorry. Okay, you get the last word. <laughs> salute our soundboard people and there's a final thing I'd like us all to do. You'll notice that it's four verses. Verse one, everybody. Verse two, women. Verse three, men. Verse four, everybody again. And I'm 90% sure you know this piece. Um, the version of it is by a, a comrade of mine named Tony Alonzo. Uh, Tony's originally from Austin, Minnesota and is a new generation of uh, church composers. But on this particular collection, he's taking old hymns and putting more contemporary accompaniments to them. So I'd invite you to stand, and we'll end my presentation with Holy, Holy, Holy.
Thank you, Father Michael.